Welcome everybody to the break. This is PI Northeast uh, segments uh, tackling major insurance topics in the news. Of course, today we are referring or talking about workers' compensation and the coronavirus. I'm Brad Latchett, the Director of Governance and Industry Affairs for PI Northeast. It's my colleague Claire Irvin. Claire, say hi. Hi, I'm the Government Affairs Council for PI Northeast. Uh, and today, Claire's meet walking us through uh, workers' comp and the coronavirus. So take it away, Claire. Yeah, so thanks for joining us. And today we'll just be quickly covering, giving some background on workers' compensation insurance, um, how the coronavirus has been impacting it and potentially can impact it, and what employers can do to minimize the risk for their employees. Just so quickly, some background on workers' compensation insurance. I'm sure all employers are well aware of that, that they're required to get this type of insurance for their employees. And employees probably know that it covers, mo it covers most workplace injuries. Um, employers are recovered to purchase it or, um, either from a private or um, kind of a state-run carrier, such as the New York State um, Insurance Fund. Um, there's also the option to self-fund coverage. If you're interested in that, there's an entire association devoted to worker self-funded workers' compensation, just as a fun fact before we dive in deeper. <laughs> um, independent contractors are responsible for their own coverage, and some, same with subcontractors. So a general contractor might be responsible for making, want to make sure that all subcontractors contractors have workers' compensation, but they're not required to provide it for the subcontractor employees or independent contractors. And it's administered by state workers' compensation boards. So the part of that purpose is so that instead of employees suing their employers for workplace injuries in the courts and taking up a substantial amount of court resources, it has its own department within the state government that handle, that administers all aspects of workers' compensation. So just as a quick overview of what covered injuries are, is it's pretty much any injury or illness that arises out of or in the course of employment. So for physical injuries, that's fairly straightforward. Um, if you trip over your own feet or uh, fall down the stairs at, at work, that is a workplace injury. It doesn't matter what the employer fault was, you got physically injured in the workplace, you can claim it under workers' compensation and it will almost certainly be covered unless the employer can prove other, prove prove otherwise, and that's a pretty high burden for the employer. Um, illnesses are technically covered, but it's much more difficult to prove. So, and that depends on, depends on a lot of factors, but generally uh, how we at least used to live, there was a lot of places you could c contract an illness throughout the course of the day, course of a week. And so it was generally very hard to prove that you caught something such as the flu um, at the workplace when you're also going to 16 other places in the course of like course of a week. So, but COVID-19, as we probably have heard, is not the flu. It is much, much more contagious. Um, and it's distinct from most illnesses, distinct from ordinary illnesses, as we are discovering with how um, we're living in times that none of us thought really imagined that we would face and why Brad and I are not, neither of us are actually in our uh, workplace at the moment. Um, yeah, so the, uh, so as a result though, COVID-19 is creating an issue for employers, um, both those that are still operating and as we start preparing to return to the workplace, what's going to happen, what's going to be the employer liability, at least from a workers' compensation perspective. Um, and so we'll, so first look at how how COVID-19 if essential workers can claim work get work access workers compensation insurance for, for contracting COVID-19 in the course of their employment um and the answer is we don't really know yet um these these workers have been required to continue going to work um, at a high risk of contracting COVID-19 um that risk varies based on where they're working um healthcare workers in particular are coming into direct contact with people who have or may have COVID-19 on a daily basis. Um, and no matter, despite all the steps that have been taken to try and reduce the likelihood they'll contract it, there's numerous stories coming out about nurses and doctors and paramedics and other healthcare workers who are contracting it despite all these best practices. Um, even beyond the healthcare industry, other essential workers are at an increased risk due to the nature of their work whether they work for public transportation, at a grocery store, um, or other various uh, workplaces deemed essential. Um, and that definition also varies on a state-by-state -state basis. 
And so they, they might not be at the same risk as healthcare workers, but they're at a higher risk than um, people telecommuting from the comfort of their com claustrophobic comfort of their homes. Um, so the big thing right now is that any essential employee who contracts COVID-19 should file the workers' compensation claim. While there's no real guarantee that it will be covered, that, that does preserve their, pre both preserve their claim, allows them to make sure they're getting the correct medical documentation in, and, and gets them to the front of the line when the workers' comp workers' compensation carriers start adjudicating them and puts them high up for an appeal to the workers' compensation boards directly. Um, the employee has to basically prove that they caught they wouldn't have caught COVID-19 had they not been going into work. And at the moment, that's actually a lot easier because people aren't going places other than for other than pretty much work and maybe the grocery store. And even the places that they are going um, that are essential, they're taking are also taking a lot of steps to minimize the spread of COVID-19. So it's a very different task than trying to prove you, would got the, you wouldn't have gotten the flu except that you went to the office that day. A healthcare worker already has a higher likelihood of being able to prove that they contracted an illness in the workplace and COVID all the steps states have taken to prevent the spread of COVID-19 really, really enhances their argument. Um, another key, for, key detail for employers who are essential and still have employees going to work is that CRIB has, CRIB has issued guidance that says that COVID-19 is unlikely to affect experience ratings. So that means it's encouraging employees to file claims, workers' compensation claims for COVID-19 will not affect your experience rating go into the future. So there's no reason not to incur, there, don't be discouraged, don't, that shouldn't come into factor in the decision. Just an employee gets COVID-19, don't, they should file the claim and workers' compensation boards and the workers' compensation carriers are in the process of figuring out how to determine, um, determine those compensation claims. There's also been potential legislation. Um, these are proposals that would allow essential or public safety workers access to workers' compensation benefits um, under the presumption that they got COVID-19 at work. So saying if a doctor gets COVID-19, it's presumed they got it at work it doesn't stop their employer from arguing otherwise, but it really shifts um, the argue, It really shifts the burden of proof as, as opposed to, and the status quo, it's up to the employee to prove that they contracted the illness in the workplace. This would presume that they contracted it and the employer would have to prove otherwise. Um, and then eventually non-essential workers are going to be going back to the office some ne as soon as next week, some at one point, in the future, uh, when future when uh, the states allow it, um, it's unlikely that these employee, employers will have employees will have the same arguments that essential workers have. Um, by then, they'll be going more places, and there'll be more places to effectively contract COVID nineteen. There's also the fact that the whole goal of all of the slow reopening is to minimize the spread in the first place. So it's unlikely that these will be covered by workers' compensation and. A lot of the legislation has been specific to, has had a specific time frame that will also not apply to non-essential workers, both in time frame and definition. So those workers, it's the same as the status quo where they can make the argument, but it's a high burden to prove. Um, those non-essential workers though, um, do have the option of emergency paid time off. That means if they start feeling COVID-19 symptoms, they can take up to two weeks of paid leave for quarantine it's, there's no positive COVID test necessary to access that leave. Um, that applies to all, empl uh, all employers with fewer than 500 employees, and all of the leave is refundable through a tax credit. So that's through the rest of 2020. So while they can't get workers' compensation for any COVID-related treatment or leave, they can at least get the paid time off, and employers should really make sure that they know that they have that leave so that, to try and minimize anyone coming, uh, minimize the likelihood someone's going to come into work with COVID-19 and therefore not spread it throughout their office. And along similar notes, there's the question for particularly non-essential employers, but really all workplaces is how, how do we keep workers healthy? And there's really no one size fits all approach that can be adopted by every workplace. I can't just send you a manual, here's 10 steps to ensure that no one will get ill. Um, I, we all wish that that existed, but unfortunately, you have to look towards all the local ordinances, state, 
and federal guidance to figure out what both you're required to do and what's being recommended. This OSHA in particular has sent out a long list of recommendations and considerations that you can adapt to your workplace. Um, in particular, they focus on cleaning procedures and administrative controls that um, you can kind of alter without kind of without huge, huge investment um, to kind of balance both the need to keep workers safe and the fact everyone has a budget. Um, and under the status quo, it will remain really hard for most employees to gain workers compensation coverage, particularly if as an employer you've been taking these steps to try and really minimize the likelihood that they're people are going to contract the illness in the workplace. On that note, uh, uh, I will just post our emails up if you have further questions. Feel free to contact me or Brad, or as well as the PI Resource Center um, at the emails and phone number, phone number on the screen. We'll also be posting some additional links below for including the OSHA guidelines. So um, you're trying to figure out how to reopen your workplace. Those are great places to start. And I'll just note this is a, Watch this space. Um, we're still going. We're still waiting to see what is actually going to be covered by the workers' compensation carriers, as well as further guidance from the boards. So, Brad, do you have any further further uh, points to bring up? Great, thank you, Claire. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, one point and a couple questions, of course. Uh, so, one point uh, that I want to mention um, related to this is um, the reclassification of employees. Um, so uh, many workers' compensation carriers and boards have um, indicated that employees who might be um, working remotely in a clerical um, role, either that was their role at work or their job description has drastically changed. For example, a construction worker who might have been up on the scaffolding, maybe home doing paperwork. Um, clearly a much different um, injury risk. So many carriers, compensation boards, have created new codes or allowing employee, employers excuse me, to re reclassify employees to remote clerical work. Um, that code obviously reduces a employer's um, premium and the risk uh, it reflects obviously the real world a risk of an injury right now for that person as opposed to the hypothetical under their old uh, job title. Uh, so that is um, something that all businesses should be uh, checking in if they have a reclassification or if their your employees are doing drastically different things, check with their workers' comp carrier uh, and see if uh, there's a new code that can be applied to help with some premium relief. A couple questions for you, Claire, if you don't mind. Um, even if you said yes, I would still ask you. So. <laughs> I'm literally <laughs> really going to um, so on the presumption legislation, it's interesting. So um, it would seem to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the legislation that would presume that an essential worker uh, contracted COVID is probably more helpful for the grocery store worker or the postal worker than maybe the nurse or the doctor, where that presumption might have already existed, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so, I, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry. What's your, go, no, go no, for it. No, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's also just with a lot of so much of the uncertainty going around, the legislation is just the elected leaders' attempts to try and offer clarity before uh, it goes into it goes up to goes to insurance companies or state boards where they can just kind of answer the question now as opposed to waiting for the those parties to figure it out. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, you know, with the presumption being at work again with a, with a doctor or a nurse, um, even if there was no presumption, you could very clearly say, "Well, I was treating a." COVID patients, so there's that, that link versus a grocery store worker or a postal worker who might have contracted, you have no idea of the people going through who has COVID and who doesn't. Um, so I think that's a help there. Uh, in addition, you mentioned uh, that there was a time frame mm -hmm. uh, where, where the, the legislation only applies during the state of emergency. Uh, I think that's particularly helpful in limiting the scope of, of I guess, this presumption. Uh, so that it doesn't extend out to maybe uh, either past the state of emergency or to other illnesses uh, like flu, for example, which I know I've heard some people um, are concerned about that this would be the quote unquote slippery slope um, of creating presumption for COVID could create a presumption for some other sort of communicable disease. And I'm not sure, I'm not seeing that as much. I don't know what your thought is on that. Yeah, I mean, my thought is that the Workers' compensation carriers, both the public and private entities, and the boards themselves are probably preparing to cover all of those workers anyway. So it's not really something that, it's not really interfering with their job, with the, uh, their current plans. But if it were to start going to past the, past the pause period 
or extend to other illnesses, then I think they would have much stronger opinions because it would be, they would be the ones bearing the brunt of that, particularly because mm -hmm. the workers' compensation carriers still have underwriting and those, and budgets to their, they have their own books. So I think they, they're probably accommodating this because it's very limited, but if it were to get broader, if I were able to say I got the flu, flu, if I got the flu in the workplace simply because I caught the flu, they would have a much stronger opinion. Right. Uh, also related to the, um, it being limited to the emergency period, I think that hopefully will provide some peace of mind to maybe employers as we're starting to transition over to um, the reopening phase, if you will. Yeah. Um, I know that there's a lot of businesses who are concerned about the liability of reopening um, and what is a, a business's liability to both employees and customers who may say they contracted COVID from while they were at a particular business. Um, in fact, this presumption, one, only applies to essential workers, but two, only exists for the state of emergency. They will ease some concerns that if an employee does claim uh, they contracted COVID outside of the emergency grace period, um, then the presumption, um, it would be much harder for them to prove, uh, you know, like it is normally. Yeah, and I think along those same lines, that's also where things like the OSHA guidance come into play, because if an employer is taking steps, such as the grocery stores have all put up those plastic screens now, that uh, minimize the amount of air particles going back between the employers, employees and customers. Um, those, those are types of steps that employers can say, we've taken to minimize the risk of contracting COVID-19. And along the same lines, once non-essential workers start going back into the office, they'll also presumably be able to start going to restaurants and go shopping again, like start actually going, um, going places. Well, so there's a lot. There's a lot more places you can contract COVID-19, whereas currently essential workers aren't go. Like I'm presuming they're not going anywhere because there's, like, there's nowhere to really go. Yeah, nobody's going to see a movie right now, right? Uh, Drive-in movie theaters reopen though. It's true. It's true. They're allowed to reopen. Yeah. So, uh, so you make a, a great point with OSHA. You know, uh, well, there's a presumption, or I shouldn't say presumption. Well, uh, showing approving that you contracted COVID from work is difficult. If employers are not taking necessary steps to protect their employees, um, then yeah. that, that pres the uh, level of difficulty be just becomes a lot easier, right? Uh, if the employee or employer is packing employees into a small space or, or not adhering to social distancing and not cleaning services and things like that. So there certainly is a responsibility on employers to make sure they're um, keeping their workplace safe in order to um, not only prevent COVID, as you indicated, nobody wants any employee to be sick for a myriad reasons, um, but also so there isn't this liability on the other end. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm under the presumption that people will follow the OSHA guidelines because they sincerely care about their employer's health, employees' health, but there's also the, li the uh, liability aspect that uh, lawyers at least like talking about. <laughs> Absolutely. The moment you say liability, people take it very seriously. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's all I have. Claire, do you have anything to add before we conclude? Nope, that, nope, that pretty much covers it. Again, this is a developing area, so we'll start seeing more and more, particularly both on the legislative front and once um, these claims start being processed by the workers' compensation carriers and going up to the workers' compensation board. Perfect. Well, thank you, Claire. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, everybody will stop in soon for the next segment of the break. Yep. Bye, everybody.